To preface this video, I want you to throw it back with me real fast. Think back to the days of you playing your PlayStation alone in the dark at night. Whether you were a kid or an adult, being completely enveloped and scared shitless as you traversed through the seemingly endless fog that surrounded you in virtual hell. If you were like me, the first time that you'd be playing this game series was when you were a kid. And yeah, I was utterly terrified of what I was putting myself through every single time I turned it on. This entire wave of terror begins all the way from the start screen and never let you go, and it seems to be something that modern mainstream horror games of late, notably the more recent installments of Silent Hill, seem to struggle with in their entirety. However, that isn't the premise of this video. By the way, don't even get me started with the HD remake. Anyway, I want to talk about Silent Hill and what led to it becoming such a commercial success, a new heartbreak, and why. In order to truly get the full picture of how this masterpiece came to be, I'd like to back you way up to the year 1999 when Silent Hill 1 was born on the PlayStation 1. This game was a total accidental success at the time. The beloved and now disbanded Team Silent was a new segment of Konami back in 1996 when development began, and as a matter of fact, the company didn't even believe in the team or their potential success going into the project when their crew was assembled. This was largely due to the 10-person team having failed at their previous projects, and the realization that their visions simply weren't aligning with the rest of Konami's status quo. We have to remember though that this was all happening during a pivotal time in video game history. Back during this era, games like Resident Evil, Quake, House of the Dead, and various others were met with overwhelming success in the states, primarily due to their shoot 'em up slash I'm a badass going out to kill monsters with ample training backgrounds that their characters possessed. Konami, understandably, wanted to tap into this success and task the team with making a commercially successful video game akin to these horror masterpieces. They wanted something that would not only be perceived well in Japan, but the United States as well. This entire idea at the time was an overwhelming challenge for Japanese game developers as a whole, since their presumption of a successful franchise with perfect box art, art style, gameplay style, and overall tone were oftentimes missed, leaving great Japanese games not only to have delayed United States releases, but also none altogether. So, Team Silent sought to make something out of their last straw at being a part of Konami, and set out to make a game to the best of their abilities. Except for one small problem. None of their developers had any previous experience with horror gaming and didn't know the exact approach to take a game such as what would become Silent Hill. So, brainstorming happened and the team eventually used their developmental freedom, which was much more prevalent during this era of gaming, to come up with something that none of the other successful developers had thought of. It would be something that would change the scope of horror gaming and spawn many, many games inspired by this notion in the future. Psychological horror. Primarily, Fear of the Unknown. Since the team didn't know which way to steer the series at the time, they banked on keeping everything vague and mysterious, taking a definite show, don't tell approach to their presentation style, and with this, Silent Hill was eventually born. And it was completely genius. The entire premise of the game follows an everyman named Harry Mason. He's driving to Silent Hill to take his adopted daughter, Cheryl, on a vacation. When arriving at the town, their car becomes enveloped in fog and Harry encounters a girl on the road. Taking a last minute swerve to avoid hitting her, his car crashes and after waking up, he finds himself lost on the side of the road in Silent Hill without his daughter. This essentially sets us off on a dark trek through the hellscape that is Silent Hill. One of the major plot points of this surrounds a cult that inhabits the town, and most of the game takes place as we find out the history of how everything came to be, all while trying to find out where the hell Cheryl is located. While doing this, Harry would encounter a great deal of characters whom largely explain to him that the darkness is overtaking the town, and how his adopted daughter, Cheryl, is sought after as the one needed to merge with another character, Alessa, in order to reincarnate their god. They're largely doing this because seven years prior to this, Alessa's mother, Dahlia, had conducted a ritual that impregnated Alessa with the cult's god. Alessa survived this event due to her new status as the god's vessel, however this ritual was not something that she wanted bestowed upon her. 
Her resistance largely caused the division of her soul into two halves, one sent to baby Cheryl and one with Alessa, thus preventing the birth of their deity. When Harry learns of this, he understands the reason for Cheryl's disappearance and becomes primarily focused on preventing this ritual from happening and birthing a demonic presence at the sacrifice of his beloved daughter. The game would go on to sell over 2 million copies, landing in a spot on the American PlayStation's list of greatest hits. Critics raved about the title, calling it a perfect sim nightmare and the perfect response to Capcom's Resident Evil. And with this, Konami realized that with their critically acclaimed success, Resident Evil has finally met its match. Off the back of the success of Silent Hill, Konami bumped the original team's silent budget and the team from a mere 2.4 million to 7.10 million dollars and from 10 to 20 people up to 50 to 70 people to allow them to create a quick successor for a release on the newly released PlayStation 2. While this decision was largely a financial one and a way for Konami to make some quick cash, gamers were the true winners in this situation given how much more polished, clearer, and downright more terrifying this sophomore installment was. The gameplay surrounding Silent Hill 2 was somewhat the same as the first. The story though is what largely takes an interesting spin. You take the role of protagonist James Sunderland as he traverses around the town of Silent Hill in search of his late wife Mary. He allegedly received a letter from her in the mail and while James knew that she was dead, he had the slight, slight sliver of hope that she might be alive. So he travels to the mysterious town in search of her. Along the way, we encounter various other characters whom, like before, seem completely oblivious to the hell that surrounds James. Each non-player character has a different personality, and they all played on a theme that was new to the series. Darkness from within, the protagonist. You see, this was the first game in the series to play on this theme, and it really threw us players for a loop when we all first encountered the other side of James, per se. Generally in video games, we take the role of the hero. We're the protagonist set out to solve an issue or some sort of central downfall. James seemed more and more to be the antithesis of this idea as the game went on. We came to find out that not only is James near suicidal, but he also directly killed Mary himself. If somehow you haven't played Silent Hill 2, allow me to take you down the rabbit hole. James and Mary were happily married until she was met with a terminal illness, leaving her mental state to steadily deteriorate. Mary was then admitted to a hospital where she spent her final years. While there, she became increasingly more hostile as time went on and eventually reached the point to where James simply couldn't cope with his own mental state as he was around her. He faced a constant and downward spiral of depression and confliction on how to handle this deteriorating marriage along with his deteriorating mental state and so he turned to drinking, becoming an alcoholic as he lives his life in a complete haze, not caring about work or free time any longer. His sexual frustrations were also very much suppressed during this time, as he wasn't able to have an intimate relationship with his now hostile wife. So James shows up to her room, kisses her on the forehead, and then shoves a pillow into her face, essentially suffocating her to death. The themes from this troubled past are prevalent in Silent Hill 2, with characters being the embodiment of these different cardinal sins that James had committed in his past. The letter that he receives at the start of the game is, essentially, a far-fetched plea for James to come visit her. James was in such denial about the murder of his wife that he heeds the plea, and what follows is a deep dive into hell that a regretful James has brought upon himself. In other words, this was a massive far cry from the story that surrounded Silent Hill 1. The second installment was also met with critical praise, and while a minor step forward for the series in terms of gameplay, the story carried the weight of the attributed success. Not to mention, this was the first appearance of our new friend who would stalk and torment us for the rest of the series, Pyramid Head, whom was largely existent as a sort of spiritual vengeance for the sins that James had committed. The Team Silent Train was rolling at this point. They would go on to create yet another installment of the series directly on the heels of the success of the second one. 
Silent Hill 3 would release in 2003, and from the start, there would be some notable changes to the flow and conventions of the game. In this one, you assume the role of Heather, whom at the start of the game finds herself in a demented amusement park after falling asleep at the mall. Monsters surround her and she hesitantly explores the area. At one point, she will eventually climb atop a ride where she's hit by a trolley, and after this, she wakes up in a burger joint at the aforementioned mall. She then calls her father and lets him know that she's on her way home. As she begins her venture back home, she's approached by a man named Douglas who seems to be a detective that claims that he has intel on Heather's dad and how she was born. Brushing him off as a creep, she tries to get away and ends up hiding in the girl's bathroom before escaping out the window to try to head back home. Before she realizes that there's no direct escape route from the window she just jumped through. She then diverts her course back through the mall and encounters a monster feasting on a corpse. As it notices and approaches her, she finds a handgun and unloads a magazine into it before it drops dead. After exploring around a bit more, she encounters a woman named Claudia, whom claims that Heather needs to remember her true self in order to lead them both to paradise with bloodstained hands. Heather, of course, is completely confused by this before coming down with a migraine, and Claudia then leaves. Our horrific journey then continues after this in what's called the Otherworld, and after defeating the first main boss, the mall then reverts back to somewhat normalcy. Heather is then approached by Douglas once again, whom seems just as confused as she. And after a bout of conversation, it's realized that he was hired by Claudia to find Heather, to her surprise. Heather would then run away from Douglas once more into an underground subway, and after a long stretch of game in this underground abyss, we would eventually emerge in a building where she meets a Vincent Smith, who makes the first reference in the game to the name of Heather's father, Harry. This would be about the time when we'd start to catch on about what's going on here. Anyway, Heather would then progress back home, and after finally reaching her destination, she would encounter a disturbing scene. The dead body of her father, Harry Mason. This of course would be the central plot twist of the game, revealing that Heather is, in fact, the child given up by the final boss of Silent Hill 1. In short, and I didn't talk about this before, Heather is Cheryl and Alessa, also known as Heather Mason. Heather begins crying over Harry's body, and after she's done, she finds a blood trail and follows it up to find Claudia waiting on her. After giving Heather her old spiel from earlier about finding her true self in paradise blah blah blah, Heather begins shooting at her before having to face the second boss of the game. Claudia then uses this divergence as an opportunity to escape being killed, informing Heather that they most definitely will meet again in the town of Silent Hill. The third installment was also met with overall praise, citing a fresh new atmosphere and giving Team Silent props for sticking to their guns with the overall horror themes. The new atmosphere, new environments, and music score were largely praised as before, and the game went on to sell over 300,000 copies and become an overall success, most notably in Japan. And lastly in the long line of PS2 entries, and what would come to be Team Silent's last efforts with the series, we have quite possibly the most unique and unorthodox take on Silent Hill with The Room. Surprisingly, this game was released only a year after Silent Hill 3, due to development happening concurrently with its predecessor. It was initially rumored to be merely named The Room, due to marketing decisions by Konami. However, this was disproved by Team Silent, and they claimed that they had wanted to make a spin-off to the series this entire time. In this game, you take the role of Henry Townshend, a man who has no intentions of visiting Silent Hill for any reason. Two years before the start of the game, Henry moved to an apartment in what's called South Asheville Heights and lived a seemingly normal life. That was, of course, until he started having terrifying nightmares that seemed to be all too real. After one of those nightmares, he wakes up to find massive chains on the door and the windows completely sealed shut, and the strange part about this is that the chains were placed on the door from the inside, leaving Henry even more confused as to how this happened. 
After five days of being able to look around and questioning the reality that we're placed in, we then find a strange and somewhat large hole in the bathroom wall. Interested, Henry investigates and crawls inside, and this is where our adventure begins to take off. Major gameplay changes were made to this installment, including the first person only view apartment mechanic that at the start of the game heals you. As you make progress, you'll begin to notice that this so-called safe area eventually becomes more and more possessed and towards the end of the game, it's a safe area no more since your health will start to deplete the longer you linger in your own home. Interestingly, nobody can hear your screams from inside and the only way to interact with what seems like your neighbors would have to take place in the dark depths of Silent Hill. These characters unfortunately aren't able to travel back to the apartment with you given the obvious to us escape hole that we're given at the end of each segment, and unfortunately, we see the demise of many that we come to know and warm up to as we traverse these different areas that we're thrown into. The game takes a different spin on the protagonist, giving a less evil and more of a depressed and lonely character who's unfortunately inherited the demonic presence that haunts this apartment. It was personally one of my favorite entries into the series, and without spoiling too much, I implore you to check it out if you somehow haven't yet. Unfortunately, the room was the outcast among all the other entries, garnering less praise than its predecessors due to its format and exhausted themes brought forth by the previous three titles that were released in such rapid succession. Nonetheless, Silent Hill 4 is an interesting concept and a fresh spin on the formula that definitely deserves a way to shine in its own light. Unfortunately, like I said before, Silent Hill would be the last installment granted to us by the beloved Team Silent. The IP was then eventually bounced around across various developers who created other somewhat large titles such as Silent Hill Homecoming, Origins, and Downpour. Now, I'm not going to deep dive into these since they aren't full dedicated entries into the series, but rather spin-offs whom all shined in their own light. Homecoming was pretty good. In fact, I finished it on the 360 when it came out with a mostly positive, albeit not very memorable experience. Something about it just felt... it was different, but it was good. You take the role of Alex Shepard who comes home to find that his little brother Joshua and his father Adam are missing and that his mother, Lillian, is in a catatonic state. The game takes you through Shepard's Glen, a segment of Silent Hill to uncover this mystery. Back during this time in the franchise, the hype was high for a Silent Hill 5. And while this wasn't a numbered installment in the series, the game really did shine in its own light. Bearing the more traditional Silent Hill format, the game felt familiar, however the story and combat definitely left much to be desired. All in all, I finished Homecoming all the way through on the 360 with a mostly positive experience. Origins was also a great title and a prequel to Silent Hill 1. I remember the excitement of being able to play it anywhere I went, and I mostly remember it as being pretty good. You play as Travis Grady, a trucker with a troubled past who takes a shortcut through the town of Silent Hill while being late for delivery. While on this detour, you encounter a flaming house and from this point onward, become entwined in the mystery of the town's religious conspiracy. This was yet another that I finished and it was probably my favorite post-Team Silent entry into the series. Downpour is... Uh, well, I mean, I finished it. Funny thing is, I remember minimal about it, which I, I bet you can assume why. The game largely felt uninspired the entire time I was playing it and, well, the whole thing just it felt underwhelming as a whole. Shattered Memories? I never actually played it. It's probably awesome, but I couldn't give you my honest opinion on it. Bottom line, I want to keep this constrained to the team's silent entries. I might come back and talk about the others in more detail in a later video, but yeah, that's for a later date. Anyway, there's just a little something that I'd really, really like to talk about now. Oh, you heartbreaker. PT, if somehow you don't know, if by the slim to off chance that you've never heard of this gym, let me bestow this upon you because this short demo single-handedly changed the future of horror gaming as we know it. PT was set to be the next big thing in horror. Straight off the heels of Metal Gear Solid 5, Hideo Kojima and his team at Kojima Productions in LA were given free reign to tackle what would possibly be the most ambitious project in horror gaming. Teamed up with film director Guillermo del Toro and actor Norman Reedus, Kojima was ready to create something not only terrifying, but with the insane attention to detail that he's always been known for. The game demo initially appeared in the PlayStation Store in 2014, cryptically titled PT, 
by a studio named 7780s Studio. It seemed to be a no-name game demo with a weird-looking game photo. However, people took the bait and upon starting it up, realized that they were in for much more than they bargained for. In the game, you take the role of, at the time, an unknown character who wakes up in a dark room. Disoriented and confused, you leave the room to be greeted by a simple hallway. It seems to be storming outside and it appears to be almost midnight. Venturing in and snooping around, you eventually come across strange photos of a family, some notes, and some items that leave you wondering where the hell you are. It's quickly realized that you're unable to call anyone and also unable to leave out the front door. So why the hell are we here? After snooping around a bit, you eventually find another door that you can go through that leads down some stairs and... Oh. It's the same place again. Yes, PT was a game set in a continuous loop, leaving you to explore the small corridor that you're given from top to bottom to encounter what the game is trying to portray. So we listen closer. Wait a minute. What's that on the radio? Two days earlier, this brutal killing took place while the family was gathered at home on a Sunday afternoon. The day of the crime, the father went to the trunk of his car, retrieved the rifle, and shot his wife as she was cleaning up the kitchen after lunch. When his 10-year-old son came to investigate the commotion, the father shot him too. His six-year-old daughter had the good sense to hide in the bathroom, but reports suggest he lured her out by telling her it was just a game. The girl was found shot once in the chest from point-blank range. The mother, who he shot in the stomach, was pregnant at the time. On the radio, we hear of a violent familicide case where a father went on a killing rampage. Pressing forward, the next few loops will give us different scenarios, such as an apparition of a woman named Lisa, a hanging bloody refrigerator, and even a skinned fetus in the bathroom sink. The game then devolves the more you uncover, and the more many puzzles you solve, the more the game spirals into madness. At the end though, spoiler alert, the father who committed familicide on the radio? Yeah. He did it because he lost his job and turned to alcoholism. His wife got a job, and the manager at that job was sexually attracted to her, thus making him spiral into lunacy, eventually serving as the sole motive for the killings. It's an entirely screwed up premise, and finally, at the end, we're told with a whisper that we've been chosen, and are granted freedom into what looks like a foggy town that... Wait. Is that Norman Reedus? Wait. This is... And then we see it. Silent Hills, in collaboration with Guillermo del Toro. And that is when gamers lost it. The hype surrounding this game became so large at the absolute worst time. Kojima was undergoing a massive split from developer Konami, and long story short, the game was cancelled a few months after it was announced. Just like that, it was ripped from us, casting it into oblivion, forever. But that wasn't it. This small snippet of a game changed the face of horror gaming today, inspiring fan recreations and spin-offs such as Alice in Road, Visage, and even Capcom's Resident Evil 7. While you can argue that the latter wasn't heavily inspired by PT, it's kind of hard to argue against it. As a matter of fact, if we didn't have PT, we likely wouldn't have had Resident Evil 7 in the form that we received it. That is how big of an impact that demo made, and that right there, ladies and gentlemen, is how a true masterpiece lives on. Silent Hill is a game series that will forever live on in gamers' hearts. The original Team Silent, with their incredible atmospheres, to level design, to impeccable soundscapes and musical scores, will forever live on in history as being the pioneers of the psychological horror genre. Without Silent Hill, there likely wouldn't be many other fantastic indie horror games on the market today, and with that, I sincerely tip my hat to Hideo Kojima and that small and now disbanded Team Silent. If there's one thing to learn from this, it's that even if you're largely rejected by your superiors and seen as an outcast, you absolutely have the capability to stick it to them and make something absolutely and unapologetically brilliant. Thank you guys for joining me on this trip down memory lane with one of my favorite horror game series ever. Before we go though, I'd like to give a shout out to the incredible NE Platinum patrons who pledged a whopping $15 a month to help make this content on this channel possible. Massive thank you to Ashley K, Hey Kappa, Deathly Logic, Carla Bernardino, Ariel Teague, David Todd, and Thomas Walker. Without you guys, 
Nightmare Expo would not be what it is today. So thank you. Anyway guys, stay awesome. I'll see you in the next one. I love you all. And good night. <laughs>